Hi everyone and welcome to this burp introduction for people who really are beginners just starting to learn burp. The motivation behind this is really that a lot of burp videos go really in depth on burp and burp is a great tool it has a lot of functionality however that's so overwhelming for people who really are just how do I find my first bug. So I'm going to go through burp tab by tab and talk about the practical uses and the kind of tabs you want to be using the most as you just start, you start out. So first off we have the dashboard here. Now the dashboard kind of has these split windows here. Now this half we can safely ignore because it's mainly, mainly pro features and this is just the community edition so we don't really have access to that. We have the tasks which once again not really that useful unless you have the pro version so we can ignore that. And finally we have the event log. Now the event log is the most important one in this kind of array of windows because it tells us when our proxy isn't working. Now if it's being weird, if it's not quite capturing data properly, if it's missing things you can see here I've got a lot of errors in here. If you find that's interu interrupting your uh, ability to test a website, you can go in here and start diagnosing problems. So that's useful. So that's the dashboard. Uh, let's go on to Target. So I have spent a few minutes going into yahoo.com and just browsing around. And as you can see, the Target kind of fills up as you explore a website. We've got everything from Mozilla because I was testing on Firefox to kind of ad sites like Google Ads and also the ones I'm actually interested in which is Yahoo. So what we need to do is really hide the, the less important things which is where this tab scope comes in. So here we can say define a scope. Now we can uh, do regexes to get the scope but I always find it easier to go into here and go add to scope and then yes. So we've got mail.yahoo, so if I go back here, and I go in here, click on this thing up here, we can go show only in scope items. Now don't be tempted to click the buttons, because the buttons are very tempting. And if we click off, you'll see that we've now narrowed it down to just yahoo, mail.yahoo.com. And we can go into the scope and go to the advanced scope control, and we can go in here and say we want to get, you know, got mail.yahoo.com, we want to add, I don't know, uh, login.yahoo.com. We go back into the sitemap, we'll see login is there as well. And what this really does is it organises the requests you make by folder. Now these aren't necessarily actual folders because they might just be root. So they might just be, you know, telling the website, no way to organise websites. But there is some stuff here that's organised by this kind of by URL and then by folder. So we can kind of think of that as being about kind of proxy traffic uh, organized by functionality, although that's not necessarily the case. So this is the primary use of this tab is really to go in here and be like, okay, I've got account, there's a challenge, okay, it's logging my password somehow. Was it sending? Was it coming back? Now the good thing about burp is that when we get a response or we get a request, what we can do is we can send to the other tools. We've got send to intruder and send to repeater. These are the ones you're going to be using the most often to find sort of your first bugs because they're the ones that actually you can find the interesting stuff in. So I'll go over those in a second but what I want to start with is just going through kind of the proxy stuff. So the next tab is the proxy. Now. The primary use of the proxy is to turn off intercept. Intercept basically stops your request, the request you're making, to the website before it gets sent and before the website has a chance to respond. So you can uh, fuzz it, you can sort of interact with it and change some of the values. Now, for most kind of basic testing, you probably don't need to intercept something until you mm -hmm. get to that point and you're like, wow, I really need to intercept that. So we can ignore that uh, and just turn it off. Now the other really useful thing here is really the HTTP history. Now if we look at the sitemap being organised by functionality, this is organised by time. So we can go up here to the filter, show any in scope items, and here we've got a kind of timeline of when we did stuff. Uh, we can organise by request number, which is the uh, 
which is the one you want to organise by because then it's just straight up. You do something, you can check the history and equally you can also see the request and the response. I prefer the HTTP history over the sitemap because I think the HTTP history organised by time makes sense for me as I'm testing the features because I want to be like, I clicked the button, okay what is that doing on the kind of side rather than trying to figure out where the button was clicked. Okay, so you also have options. Now the only one that's worth mentioning in here is down here for the SSL pass through. If you're testing on mobile, sometimes you won't be able to connect to iCloud or Google Play because of their own security functionalities like SERP pinning. If you do find that you just cannot access a website and it's getting all these errors, you can try adding SSL uh, negotiation failure here, which will, if they can't make the SSL, if Burp can't make, the S can't make the SSL connection, it will just send it as if it was a regular request. So it won't show up in Burp, but it will make the request. Okay, so then there's intruder and repeater, which are the two big ones I want to talk about. But I'm going to start with repeater and then go on to intruder. So repeater allows you to repeat a request. So if we go back into target and we go into our one of our requests we've made here, we made a login request uh, and it's doing something in here. So if we go here, we can go right click, send to repeater, and the request appears here. So what we can do is we can try and fuzz some of these values, we can edit them, we can delete them. Like, do we need that Y value? I don't know. What happens if we delete it? Nothing. So that Y value does something we're not sure about. Now, for something like this logon page, which has just a ton of stuff, it's not that useful. Well, when we start to look at login forms, where we're sending something like a, um, uh, a username or a password, you know, or if we're doing something where we're interacting with an API where we have a kind of, you know, product, can we do things like, okay, what if I log into another account, can I do something on the second account, which is actually a request I made from the first account by just changing the cookies. So that's called finding IDORs. So all you need to find an IDOR is really the repeater. You can do it all manually. You can go in here, you can find the cookie, which is AS, and you can physically edit that cookie here. You can just remove it. What does it do? Nothing interesting. Um, but yeah, that's the kind of primary use of this is to find idols. The other use of it is to find interesting endpoints. And really what you want to do when you're testing is trying to take in all of the data. You know, we have so many requests in our um, thing here. What of these are actually important? Like, what does create do? Is it doing anything interesting? Probably not. Like, login, that sounds interesting. And there's just something called D there, which could be interesting. That could be just obfuscated um, endpoints. So... This is really useful for finding those idols where you're able to access something you shouldn't be able to have access to because you're logged into the wrong account and you're using, you know, the cookie from one account, but you're making changes on the first account. It's useful for finding business logic errors. If you're, say, got something where you can set a quantity of something, what happens if you set it to a quantity of, instead of one, minus one? Or, in, you know, if you can add a coupon code, are you sending the actual coupon, like the amount it's discounted by? And using something like Repeater, you can sit there and you can edit these requests and kind of fuzz that. So that is the first the first major use of Burp. Now the second one is something called Intruder. And what Intruder does is it's a brute forcing. Now brute forcing, I think a lot of people have the idea that it's like, oh yeah, we're going to brute force passwords. We're not. So if we go on to something like payload all the things, we'll see, okay, SQL injection here. There's so many different types of SQL injection. How on earth are we supposed to test all of this? We can't do that manually. So what we're going to do is we're going to go into the intruder here, and you'll see that depending on what database we're using, we've got uh, blind 
SQ, uh, SQL injection uh, for different databases. And FuzzDB here is very similar in we have things like discovery, uh, things like predictable file paths. So we can test if any of these exist quite easily using Intruder. So how do we do it? Okay, so we go back to either target or proxy or even repeater. You can do this straight from a repeater request and send to Intruder. We'll go in here, we'll go into proxy. Uh, and we'll go, okay, are we sending anything there? Yeah, let's go for that one. So we've got a username and a password and a verify password here. So we'll send that to Intruder. And one of the good things that we can do is called a blind SQL injection. So if we want to do an SQL injection, we have to open up SQL map. It takes a time. So let's find, let's do our own kind of test to see if it's SQL injectable. So you'll see here the little simoleon signs, the paragraph separators have decided what it wants us to fuzz and to change. But we're just going to clear those because we want to check these ones here. We want to check the name, the password, the context, whatever that is, and the password. So we can go here and we can add a simoleon. And we can go here and add a simoleon. And we can go here and add a simoleon. And here and add a simoleon. So, oh, whoops. Make sure I cover that all with the simoleon. There we go. So what I'm really doing here is I'm saying that within this, this is what we want to replace with whatever our text files are. So let's do a blind SQL injection. So we've set this up. So we think the SQL injectable ones are going to be the display name, the username, password context, and the password itself. So we'll go into payloads. Now this is where we load in all of our payloads. So we can go here, payload all the things, and let's try a generic time-based SQL injection. Now, a generic time-based SQL injection is super useful because it can tell us whether or not something's SQL injectable by just looking at the time difference. So what we say when we do a time-based SQL injection is we let the database wait. And that's all we're doing. We're not trying to uh, access database. We're just saying, hey, wait. If it's SQL injectable, that page will wait for us. So we're going to paste this list in here. So we've got some sleep and sleep. We've got some maths going on. Cool. So we do that, and that's all we need to do. We just press start attack, and then it's doing the intruder attack. So what you'll see is, oh, we don't, we don't have a list of uh, the times. Uh, and we can look, and we can see, but there's a response received and a response completed. You just need to enable them. So what we're looking for is if something takes far too long. Like we're looking for essentially anomalies here. So if we go up to response received, we might be able to say, oh, those took, those took some time. Could that mean that they're SQL injectable? Might be, might not be. Might just be the web server is taking longer. But really what we're doing here is we're looking for those endpoints that seem suspicious, right? We're not looking for bugs we're looking for something that could be a bug so looking at these you know we're looking and that one is the display name and that one might also be display name and that one might be display name so what we're doing there is saying hey well maybe maybe the display name is sql injectable we can then load that up into sql map and test it that way so that's one of the kind of use cases for finding sql injections using Intruder. It's also super useful for using something like uh, FuzzDB where you can use the discovery file. And really there's a ton of stuff here that's all about finding themes or just finding um, folders that no one really wanted us to find. Uh, we have webs, different web servers, different languages. They all have these kinds of potential files in there. So that's always a really good one to test with Intruder just because you're looking at 
okay, does this file exist? Does that file exist? Finding interesting API endpoints by looking at what are the common ones. You know, we can predict login, but if we have something like products and ads and stuff like that, we can discover that using Intruder. So primary use of Intruder is to either do kind of like this, uh, send payload, see what comes out. Do you get a different length, a different uh, response? You're looking for things outside the ordinary here. This is like a, a little signpost that says, hey, that looks weird. Um, then we have um, the use case of discovering things that we weren't ever supposed to find. Discovering API endpoints, discovering files, um, and each of those can lead, lead to a bug. Um, so I'm just going to stop this. And I'm going to go over one final feature, or two final features. One is the decoder, which just allows you to URL encode things. You know, if you're sending something like this to a web page, you can encode it as uh, a URL. So you don't have to be messing about with it. Um, and you can also decode things. If you mouse over things, it will attempt to decode things anyway. Um, so you don't need to worry, like if I, if I mouse over this one here, it will tell me what it's um, pointing to. So finally, I want to talk about Extender. Now, Extender just allows you to install except extensions to Burp. So we go, these are the extensions. I have JSON Beautifier turned on so I can see JSON look really nice. There's also a BAP store, and there are so many of these. Like, some of them require the premium version, but some of them can be really useful. Like, uh, SQL map uh, integration, which doesn't require premium, but you can send responses from BERT directly to SQL map and tell it what the parameters are and get, make sure the cookies get sent properly and stuff like that. So that can be really useful for kind of finding the... Uh, or, or kind of integrating everything into like one area and there are some really useful ones here about finding idols There's a great video that stock put out about finding idols and I think that covers about everything this is I promise all you need to find your first bug just intruder repeater proxy target that's it you don't need to pay you don't need to find like amazing bugs for your first try you can just look at the kind of low hanging fruit it's not going to be necessarily easy to find but it will be easier and especially once you start to get used to kind of the powerfulness that intruder has and the ability to work out what looks weird that's what you want to develop your sense of like that request looks a little bit weird that response looks a little bit weird Finding those are what finds you your first bug. So thank you for listening to my talk on burp, and I hope you guys find some nice bugs. Thank you. Have a good day.